That's just some of what's ahead this New Year's weekend on C-SPAN. You are looking at a live picture of the oldest building of three of the Library of Congress. The library was created about 1800 for Congress, but it's now a public reference library. It is the world's largest library and is now in three buildings. Important acquisition include Thomas Jefferson's library and the Smithsonian collection. Moving over to the left, coming into focus, is the Supreme Court of the United States. The court first assembled on February 1st, 1790 in the Merchants Exchange Building in New York City, then the nation's capital. The Supreme Court was not provided a building of its own until 1935, its 146th year of existence. The Supreme Court offers a variety of educational programs. Lectures in the courtroom are given every hour on the half hour when the court is not in session. The court will be meeting for its new session in January. Next, the CIA in the Truman administration. This two-hour discussion reviews the years 1945 to 1953. Panelists include former CIA Director William Colby. The program was part of a conference on the history of the agency held by the CIA's Center for the Study of Intelligence. We now shift to the international context, 1945 to 1953, and our panelists are Deborah Larson and William Colby. Deborah Larson is Associate Professor of Political Science at UCLA. She's the author of Origins of Containment, a Psychological Explanation. Her articles are published regularly in professional journals. The role of belief systems and schemas in foreign policy decision making was published this winter in Political Psychology. Dr. Larson was the recipient of the Eric H. Erickson Career Award of the International Society of Political Psychology in 1991. William Colby is known to most of you as Director of Central Intelligence from 1973 to 1976. He's a graduate of Princeton and Columbia University Law School and has been an attorney in private practice and with the U.S. government. He served with the OSS and as CIA's Executive Director Controller and Deputy Director for Operations. Mr. Colby is the author of a number of books, including Honorable Men and Lost Victory. He's now a member of the Washington Consulting Consortium. The CIA had a particularly important role to play in the early part of the Cold War because the Soviet threat was perceived to be primarily political and psychological rather than military. Accordingly, Washington poured resources into psychological warfare. What I'm going to talk about today is the European context for this interest in covert operations and psychological warfare. I'm not a veteran of covert operations, and so those of you who are better informed than I am about what went on, um, I welcome to tell me what actually happened. But I'll, gi I'll give you the academic point of view. In February 1947, Greece was on the verge of falling under the control of a communist-led guerrilla movement. George Kennan warned that the fall of Greece might have a bandwagon effect on the rest of Europe. Communist parties in Italy and France would be strengthened. Other states would believe that communism was the wave of the future. The U.S. might lose control of the Iberian Peninsula in northern Africa. In the Truman Doctrine speech in 1947, Truman requested $400 million worth of aid to Greece and Turkey. Although the Truman Doctrine was directed specifically at Greece and Turkey, U.S. officials knew that much greater aid would be needed for Western Europe. In 1947, there was a serious economic crisis in Europe, brought about by the wartime destruction, an unusually harsh winter, and disruption of traditional trading patterns. 
Europeans were starving and shivering in the cold, and to make matters worse, there was a shortage of coal. In April, the French pleaded for additional shipments of grain so that they would not have to reduce bread rations. 45% of Europe's imports were paid for with U.S. assistance. When the, when the United States began reducing its loans, the Europeans would have to cut purchases of feud, food and fuel, which could lead to massive political unrest. State Department, officials that the Euro State Department officials feared that the Europeans might turn to communism out of despair and desperation. Both Italy and France had coalition governments in which the communists were represented. Communists held four cabinet positions in France, including the, the post of vice premier and minister of defense. About one-third of the electorate in France and Italy supported the Communist Party. In the 1946 elections in France, the Communists received the largest number of votes. Italian moderates were uncertain of American support and unwilling to offend the Soviet Union by casting out the Communists. The Truman administration was worried that the Communists could win power through elections in Italy and France. Communist regimes in Italy and France might negotiate agreements with the Kremlin and take their countries into the Soviet orbit. Bolstered by the Truman Doctrine and by the hope of U.S. financial assistance, the governments of Italy and France in May 1947 excluded the Communist members. On June 5, 1947, Secretary of State George C. Marshall offered the Europeans assistance for reconstruction. The most important objective was to prevent communism from advancing into Western Europe. The Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine were both aspects of the containment policy, the use of economic and military assistance to block the spread of communism. Although the Truman Doctrine had anti-communist rhetoric, whereas the Marshall Plan was purely humanitarian in its rhetoric, the Soviets were much more threatened by the Marshall Plan than they were by the Truman Doctrine. Stalin was not alarmed at U.S. aid to Greece because the Soviets were not supporting the communist uprising in Greece. Stalin considered Greece to be in the Western sphere of influence. The Marshall Plan, and particularly U.S. plans to rebuild Germany, terrified the Soviets. One of the objectives of the Marshall Plan was to rebuild the western zones of Germany. The Soviets were afraid that the United States was planning to use Western Europe as a base for attack. Otherwise, Soviet officials reasoned, why would the Americans be so generous with their capitalist rivals? Why would the U.S. spend millions of dollars to build up other countries' economies? According to a French communist leader, Maurice Thorez, Moscow feared that the United States would use economic aid to build up Western Europe as a jumping off place for attacking Soviet Russia. Stalin's fear of Germany and of the Marshall Plan led him to take several actions which frightened the United States. The first Soviet reaction was the establishment of the Common Form. The Common Form, or Communist Information Bureau, was the director of the International Communist Party. Its predecessor, the Comintern, had been dissolved in 1943. This was mainly a symbolic gesture because the common form had no real power. But Americans feared the spreading tentacles of communism. Stalin put Zhdanov, a hardliner, in charge of the common form and of carrying out ideological activities within the Soviet Union. Zhdanov told the first organizing meeting of the common form in September that the Marshall Plan was aimed at overthrowing the, quote, new democracies in the Balkans. He explained that the Marshall Plan was designed to lure Eastern Europe into a trap and shackle them with the fetters of dollars. Just as the Truman Doctrine was the U.S. declaration of Cold War, so Zhdanov made a speech which was the Soviet declaration of Cold War. He said that the world was divided into two camps, capitalism and socialism. It was the mirror image of the Truman Doctrine.
At the same meeting, Zhdanov told representatives from the Italian and French Communist parties that they should struggle against the Marshall Plan. The Italian and French Communists were not pleased with these instructions. During the war, the Italian and French Communists had cooperated with the non-fascist parties, and they had won considerable support doing so. Now, the Soviets told them that they should try to block the success of the Marshall Plan by engaging in strikes, walkouts, riots, even though this would slow down economic recovery and worsen the plight of the working man. In fact, the strikes and walkouts carried out by the Italian and French communists backfired because they resulted in the loss of support. But the strikes did frighten Western liberals and social democrats. On September 26, 1947, the CIA circulated the first of its monthly reviews of the world situation as it relates to the security of the United States. The memo stated that only the Soviet Union could threaten the security of the United States, but the Soviets were presently incapable of military aggression outside of Europe and Asia, even though they were deliberately conducting political, economic, and psychological warfare against the United States. The greatest potential danger to U.S. security, according to the CIA, lay in the possibility of the economic collapse of Western Europe and of the consequent accession to power of elements subservient to the Kremlin. George Kennan later recalled that in 1947 to 1948, Washington was alarmed at the encroachments made by communism in Italy and France. He later testified before the Church Committee that the communists were gaining control of publishing companies, the press, labor unions, student organizations, etc., in both France and Italy. In autumn 1947, the CIA provided funds that helped defeat the communists in the French elections. The CIA also subsidized non-communist unions in France helping to split them off from the communist unions and averting a general strike. In response to the challenge represented by the common form, the United States decided to resort to psychological warfare against the Soviet Union. Psychological warfare meant primarily propaganda. In December 1947, National Security Council Directive 4-A put the CIA in charge of covert psychological operations. U.S. psychological warfare was a necessary complement to the huge financial resources that the U.S. was spending in the Marshall Plan. It was designed to prevent the Communist parties from sabotaging the success of the Marshall Plan through the use of propaganda or agitation. The initial target of psychological warfare was Italy. Bribes, propaganda. Now the Marshall Plan could not succeed if the Soviets interfered with German recovery. European recovery needed German coal, steel, chemical, fertilizers. Because the Soviets had a veto, the control, the control Commission in Germany could not operate effectively. The Western countries decided to take matters into their own hands. In February 1948, the United States, Britain, France, and the Benelux opened a conference on Germany in London to which the Soviets were not invited. They decided to discuss unifying the Western zones giving the West Germans control over their government, currency reform. Stalin saw the United States engaged in an effort to rebuild Europe, rebuild Germany, extend American influence over Europe using dollars, and isolate the Soviet Union. As part of his reaction to the Marshall Plan and to steps toward the formation of a West German government, Stalin cracked down on Eastern Europe. He had non-democratic politicians shut out of the governments of Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. In Bulgaria, the opposition leader Nikola Petkov was executed.
In Poland, 17 non-communists were tried as traitors. In Hungary, prominent members of the opposition had to go underground into hiding. Until this time, the Czechoslovakian government had managed to maintain a democracy. They did whatever the Soviets wanted in foreign affairs, and in return, they were left alone to manage their internal affairs, a classic sphere of influence. In February 1948, 12 non-communist members of the Czech cabinet resigned in order to force a new election. The Czech communists used this as an opportunity to establish a communist government. After taking over, the communists carried out purges and trials of political opponents. There was no direct evidence of Soviet involvement. The Soviets only had 500 troops in Czechoslovakia at the time. On March 10, the non-communist premier, Masaryk, jumped to his death from his bathroom window. It is unclear if it was suicide or murder. There's some evidence that Masaryk was about to flee the country, and in order to av avoid embarrassment, he was murdered and then pushed out of the window. The Czech coup seemed to prove that democratic institutions were more fragile than had previously been believed. United States officials inferred that Soviet dominance was likely to come about through local subversion, not military conquest. Truman used the Czech coup to get the Marshall Plan through Congress, restore the draft, and increase the military budget for air power. Before the Czech coup, the Marshall Plan was having a hard time getting through Congress. In light of the Czech coup, the Western European countries became concerned about the military imbalance in Europe. The Soviets had 30 divisions in Central and Eastern Europe alone, whereas combined French, British, and United States forces amounted to less than 10 divisions. In March 1948, Britain, France, and the Benelux countries signed the Brussels Treaty, a predecessor of NATO. Under the treaty, the five countries agreed to cooperate with one another militarily. The treaty created the Western European Union. The British asked the United States for a firm commitment to defend Europe against aggression. But for the United States to join an alliance would be a violation of our traditional policy and would require congressional approval. Congress was wary about permanent U.S. commitments to Europe. For various reasons, the communists did not win in the Italian elections in 1948. Instead, the Christian Democrats won 48.5% of the popular vote. The defeat of the Italian communists showed that the momentum of communism could be stopped. Heartened by the Christian Democrats' victory in the Italian elections, the Truman administration decided to increase support for covert operations. Kennan pushed hard to make special operations permanent and to enlarge the scope of covert operations. In June 1948, NSC 10-2 superseded NSC 4-A. NSC 10-2 established a new covert operational branch within the CIA, the Office of Policy Coordination. It was authorized to carry out propaganda, economic warfare, sabotage, and subversion against hostile states. In order to reassure France about the formation of a West German government, Washington began to coordinate military plans with the British and French. Senator Arthur Vandenberg, a former isolationist who headed the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, sponsored a congressional resolution that became the basis of NATO. Dean Acheson promised Congress that American troops would not be stationed in Europe permanently, but only until Europe recovered. The Truman administration did not regard the Soviet Union as a military threat. U.S. troops were intended to reassure Europe and to prevent popular panic so that recovery could get underway. But now the Soviets were alarmed. The Americans were breaking a tradition that went all the way back to George Washington, that of avoiding alliances except in the case of war. The Soviet government pointed out that an American-West European alliance was proposed in peacetime, when nobody threatened the security of either the United States or Western Europe. 
The Soviets were even more concerned about Western steps toward establishing a government in the Western zones of Germany. The Western countries decided to issue a new currency in the Western zones of Germany to stop inflation. A currency reform was an important step toward the creation of a West German government. Money can only be issued by a central government. It symbolizes sovereignty. On June 18, 1948, the Western countries announced that they were going to issue a new currency for the Western zones. The Soviet response to the currency reform was to blockade West Berlin. On June 24, the Soviets closed off all routes to Berlin except from the air. The city had enough food for 36 days. Berlin was a Soviet hostage. Stalin's goal was to pressure the Western countries into giving up the idea of establishing a separate West German government. But the blockade had the opposite effect. It hastened progress toward establishing a West German government and incorporating it into NATO. Truman chose to airlift supplies to Berlin as a compromise between retreat and war. Finally, in May 1949, the Soviets lifted the blockade. They had failed entirely in their aims. Instead of blocking the establishment of a West German state, the Soviet move had spurred it on. The Berlin blockade led to the formation of NATO in April 1949. France decided that the Soviet Union was now a bigger threat than Germany. The Berlin crisis was part of an action-reaction syndrome. Marshall Plan, Czech coup, currency reform, Berlin blockade, NATO. Each side perceived the other's defensive actions as offensive. Each side took countermeasures. The result was a spiral of conflict that neither side intended. United States officials did not intend to threaten the Soviet Union. They were only trying to achieve security by stopping the spread of communism. But the measures necessary to rebuild Western Europe and stop communism, which included integrating West Germany into the Western alliance, threatened the Soviet Union. After the North Koreans invaded the South in 1950, U.S. officials have feared feared for a short period of time that the Soviets might resort to war in Europe, such as between East and West Germany. United States covert action continued in France and Italy throughout the 1950s as psychological warfare continued, and that was the Cold War. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. The last time I was here was 18 years ago uh, on this stadium, but uh, it is a pleasure to be back. I, one connection with President Truman was to push doorbells for his campaign in 1948 in Upper West Side, New York. And I remember being kind of suspicious by pushing these doorbells that uh, so many of the people were giving me a very positive answer that yes, they thought he was a great fellow and they were going to vote for him. And I dismissed that as being a traditional democratic uh, area, and so it couldn't possibly re result in his victory in the election. Well, of course it did. Later, of course, I went to work for him in CIA. He was way up there and I was way down there, so we didn't have any contact. But uh, I would not like to go over the specifics of our post-war history, but rather to talk about the role of CIA in Europe during this period of the buildup and the change. I think you look at it from the point of view that we had just finished the great crusade against fascism. We had a 12 million man and woman armed forces in 1945. By the end of 1946, we had about a million and a half. We sent all the rest home, and many of you profited from that, by the GI Bill and all that sort of thing. We then were faced with the fact that there was a remaining threat coming up. And I think many in my generation considered that the rise of the Cold War was merely a continuation of the kind of threat that we had finally faced up to long later than we should have against Hitler. That that totalitarian threat was quite comparable to the totalitarian threat that Hitler offered. 
There were obvious differences but, uh, in many respects, but nonetheless that it was part of it. Well, part of that change, of course, was that our former allies had become our adversaries. And this required some rejiggering of relationships. That indeed, the Fran French and Italian resistance, which we had worked with very forcefully during the war against Germany, now turned out to be a major subversive force in those two areas. In the, in the liberation of France in 1944, a good portion of southwest France was taken over by communist units who decided that they didn't want any other government than a communist one in that area. And there were even executions and so forth that took place. That was the first scent that something was a little wrong in the relationship. Of course, we made the Treaty of Yalta, which said that there would be free elections in Eastern Europe. There weren't free elections in Eastern Europe and nobody could do anything about it without confronting the Red Army. The Red Army had replaced local resistance forces in Poland and places like that with their own governments as their Red Army moved forward. So there was no question about it. There was an offensive, aggressive threat to Western Europe and to indeed to our kind of free civilization. We saw this coming in various areas, and we saw the communist parties develop according to the common forms enthusiastic uh, support in countries like Italy and France and others. And we saw that the, they were building their legal force, not only the parties, but the communist trade unions, the communist farmers groups, the communist cooperatives, the communist youth groups, women's groups, lawyers groups, all the rest of it the whole panoply of international fronts for the communist political offensive. Now, CIA's initial reaction to this, of course, was to try to reestablish some intelligence capabilities in Europe. We turned first, in many respects, to developing liaison relationships with governments, and included in that was one which was quite controversial in the reestablishment of a relationship with General Galen and his service in Germany, because he had, after all, concentrated during World War II on Eastern Europe and the Soviet actions there. So there was a fund of knowledge that was very handy to us. We sensed that it was politically difficult and, and delicate, but at the same time, the threat demanded that we take such steps necessary to do that. In later years, we can criticize it. But looking at it at the time, it seemed quite a reasonable thing to do. We did not consciously establish links with Nazi groups, but rather with representatives of the Wehrmacht, who after all, a number of whose officers had participated in the effort against Hitler. So that there was that thinking. My first assignment in the field for CIA in Europe was a rather strange one. We were preparing for the advent of a Soviet occupation of Western Europe. We were laying down the supplies, doing the training, establishing the networks of potential resistance organizations to rise in the case the Red Army overcame those countries. I worked in Scandinavia, and that was one of my main functions. Since I had worked there during the war, I was supposed to know my way around the mountains a little, which I, I deny, but uh, nonetheless, we. That was a conscious preparation, I point out, of a defensive program, not an offensive to the Soviet Union. At the same time, we were trying to build up our capabilities of knowing what was happening behind the now curtain that had developed. And initially, we tried to use the same tactics and techniques that had been proved so successful in Western Europe during World War II. We parachuted agents into countries like the Baltic countries, Poland, various others. We established relationships with putative resistance organizations against Soviet occupation, only to find that in some of those that we were dealing with the very authorities we were trying to resist, because they managed to fool us, as in Poland, rather thoroughly. The agents we dropped in uniformly disappeared in a very short time, and we discovered that action in a communist totalitarian society was a very different thing than action 
in a, in a occupied Europe or even in a fascist society, that indeed there was a different dimension to it. It was at best explained to me by a, an Estonian lady that I ran into in Sweden. She had been through an occupation under both the, the Germans and the Russians. She said it was very interesting. When the Germans took over, you had to avoid all resistance or you would be shot. And you had to do your job to contribute to the economy. But then, if you did those two things, you would be pretty much left alone. But she said, when the communists came over, however, and they occupied the Baltic countries for a while, you had to avoid all opposition. You had to do your job to contribute to the economy. But there was a third dimension. You had frequently to go down to meetings, political meetings, to become enthusiastic about the new rule. And she said, you know, it sounds funny, but after a while it begins to get you. So that when the option came up to leave with the Germans, or at the time the Germans withdrew, she and many other people from Eastern Europe fled to the West to avoid that kind of totalitarian control over the mind as well as the bodies of the people they were running. So we also tried, tried to figure out some new techniques of using defectors, using refugees for interrogations, all of that sort of thing, trying to develop agents among the various authorities, particularly among some of the Eastern European countries, which could give us some view into the, what the policies and programs of the new government were there. These were moderately effective. Now, we did undertake one very significant offensive effort, and it was a political effort against the occupied territories, against the then Soviet Union. But it was psychological. It was not physical. We did develop the very famous radios, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, in order to carry news of reality into those areas, to give the people an alternate view of what was happening. We also revealed certain aspects of the new society, particularly the gulag, which was the source of a great deal of revelation, which we got from such sources as we could to describe Stalin's extensive group set of labor camps and prisons, which Solzhenitsyn later may put out so dramatically. But we began that process of showing the reality of life in communism as against the glories of so-called socialism that were taught, touted at the time. And of course, we tried to support the concept of the captive nations. The fact that nations in Eastern Europe had been captured by an, a foreign and alien society. The various Eastern European countries and even some of the other exile movements and so forth that we supported in order to create a climate of opinion that said that those countries were suppressed and that that same threat existed if the communist effort expanded beyond its then limits. Now, in the West, however, we also engaged in a major program. And again, these were less physical and more political and psychological. We first said that, as Ms. Larson said, there was a danger that several of these countries might vote themselves into communism by mistake, by error, by fraud, whatever. And that it was a problem of strengthening the resistance to communism. Now, at that point, we all considered that the communists were on the left. And so the question comes to mind, why didn't we turn to the right to resist the communists? Because there were some very smart people running our programs at the time. And they said, look, you can turn to the right. And at that point, you leave the center open to penetration by the communists. And then, if they get both the left and the center, they've got the victory. The battle will take place in the center. The battle for the loyalties of these Western European countries will be a center battle. And the right is irrelevant, because the right has nowhere else to go. So the very conscious program and policy was developed to strengthen the center democratic forces in Western Europe to resist the entreaties of the left. Now, we had a long argument in Italy later on about whether we could split the socialists from the communists 
in which case the communists would drop down to about a 20 percent, 25 percent uh, of the votes and be no real threat to Italian liberty and participation in Western democracy. We had a, many discussions about that. I was for doing it. Uh, others thought that the socialists were not uh, quite reliable enough, having been allied with the communists for so many years. And so we did not do that until the early 60s. But the initial idea, I think, is the important thing, that this was not a thoughtless strengthening of the right to suppress the left. It was rather a battle for the center so that we could have democratic societies in Western Europe. Similarly, there was an intellectual contest, and a very important one. The intellectual contest as to what the intellectuals thought about the world. Were they going to be sympathetic with the revolution, with the changes advocated by the socialist nations and so forth? Or would they find more value in the importance of freedom, free speech, free uh, press, free broadcasting, and so forth. And so CIA, again, seeing that the center was the big area of contest, began to support groups of intellectuals, the Congress of Cultural Freedom, for instance, various others. We had to meet the communist peace offensive, which was a major offensive, which tried to identify the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe with the cause of peace and the truly it was the West that was building its forces and, and threatening the, the end of peace. And this was carried on at massive expense by the communists uh, to have world congresses of peace, youth congresses, and so forth. So that as part of our effort to meet that challenge, we began to support groups in the West and in this country who would participate in those congresses, who would speak for the importance of freedom as well as real peace, rather than the peace of the gulag. There's a very famous lady who was very anti uh, the establishment for many years. I'll leave her name out at her personal request. But she said, yes, she was supported by CIA when she went to one of these congresses. And she said the interesting thing about it was CIA never told us what to say. They just said, go over there and act like a free American student say whatever you think free American students say. That's all you're asked to do. Nothing more than be yourself. And she, I think for good reason, couldn't find anything very wrong with that, even though CIA had paid the travel and the very modest expenses, I'm sure, that were involved. Well, the result of that was after they held a peace conference in, in uh, Vienna that they, to some extent, controlled, they never tried to hold another one outside of the real Iron Curtain because they wanted to have control, absolute control, of the scenario of any such congresses. Well, that was begun in the early 50s under President Truman, that panoply of efforts, and it, it continued on during the 1950s, of course. It was enormously helped from time to time by Soviet actions, such as the, the uh, coup in Czechoslovakia, such as the assistance by the, by the Soviets, well known to the political movements in Western Europe, such as the Khrushchev's secret speech, which confirmed everything that we had been saying about Soviet society under Stalin, and such as the, the suppression of the re revolution in Hungary in 1956, which rather dramatically showed the suppression of an effort toward freedom. We lost some of those efforts. We lost the one in Albania, of course. We say be partly because it was, uh, it was, uh, it was there was traitors in our own midst, the British group, the Philbies, and so forth. We lost some others. Uh, but even the appearance of these rebellions, such as in Berlin in 1953, dramatized the fact that freedom was very much the objective of many, many people in that area. Now. In the, by the time the 60s came along, the major battle had finished. The Western Europe was protected. Western Europe had been threatened by the Red Army, who was met by the NATO. It was threatened with economic collapse, which was met, met by the Marshall Plan. And it was threatened by subversion. Our estimates at the time 
where that the Soviets were spending something like $50 million a year in Italy on political operations. Now, I don't know how good our estimates are. I've been dying to see some of the records of the, of the uh, International Park Department of the CPSU to see whether our estimates were anywhere near right. But I'm, I'm sure they were very substantial, and that has been admitted by many, many people. After all, when, they, when you have a, a, a receipt comes out of those records, which shows Gus Hall getting $2 million to support the infinite, infinitely small American Communist Party, you can imagine what they might have been doing for Italy or something like that. Now, in the 60s, we began to see the revelations. The Bay of Pigs was a revelation in a sort. It was also a disaster, There's no question about it. The book Invisible Government started it. Then the, in, then the Ramparts discussions toward the end of the 60s, 67, showing that we had had a relationship with the National Student Association. This particular document on page 383 has a rather interesting memorandum discussing that how important it was that we not be seen as interfering to some degree into the NSA, but that we could perhaps support particular projects abroad that might be of some value, but put those in without the NSA knowing that government money was being used for it. You could see the desire to use the power of American student bodies, but the sensitivity, even in those days, of the CIA to the problems of engaging in internal activities of any sort. So, the result of some of these began to be a phasing down Obviously, as the Italian situation settled, the need for subvention of the center parties declined. Some people now say, well, when CIA stopped paying them, they started to get it, get it out of the businesses, and then that created this, the present situation of corruption. Ms. Falacci got me one time, said, uh, why, Mr. Colby, you have corrupted my country. And I said, Ms. Falacci, Italy may have had a problem with corruption, a long time ago before there ever was a CIA, and I still stick to that. So I would say that if you look at the record of CIA in Europe during those early days, we set up the, the systems by which we had to meet a whole new kind of world warfare. It was a war, a political war, and we made some mistakes, we did some things wrong, but on the overall, I'd give us a good B plus. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Chuck Kogan of the Olin Institute. I had a couple of uh, points of detail, uh, which sounds better in English than it does in French, uh, on the uh, presentation of Dr. Larson. Firstly, uh, I believe you mentioned that there was aid in the French elections of 47, the political elections. Uh, this is news to me, but uh, I wasn't among those who had to stand up this morning as having been associated with the Truman administration. Uh, certainly there was aid to the French trade unions, but uh, I wasn't aware of this political party's uh, involvement, which would uh, be of interest, since France is a subject of interest to me. And the second point is uh, the Brussels Pact of 48, described as the forerunner of NATO. In a sense, it was, but uh, the Brussels Pact technically did not create the WEU. The WEU was created in 54 out of the failure of the European defense community. And uh, that produced the modified Brussels Pact of 54, which created the WEU. WEU. Uh, I would be interested in knowing whether there was any discussion at the time of the Brussels Pact as to whether the US, that is in 48, whether the US was uh, considering participation. Thank you. Oh, yes. 
Um, U.S. Uh, military and political leaders tried to reassure the Europeans that we would go to their defense, but there was a major problem with Congress. Uh, there, it was unclear if Congress would support membership in an alliance, and Vandenberg wasn't sure that he could get his resolution through um, when, when in March 1948. So there were, there were informal discussions and in tacit commitments, but nothing formal, as far as I know. Oh, the French elections. I've only read in general terms about um, aid to the French elections. I had trouble finding specifics about what we actually did. Uh, so you could very well be right. I, I use the term aid vaguely because that's all I was able to find. I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dave Davidson, retired CIA. Mr. Kova, you mentioned the Vienna Conference in passing. Wasn't that the one that we got a hold of all the uh, of the ones uh, the Soviets had invited worldwide? We got a hold of the list of the invitees. I hope this still isn't classified. I, I think I remember. But I hope, I, I know, I do know this indirectly uh, to bring it back to the Truman administration. Uh, the president thought this was the most wonderful operation in the world. Uh, I, don't, I, I think I've read it beforehand. But here's what, I, what happened, and you may verify it or not. If it's classified, you probably won't verify it. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> the communist uh, did not invite everybody worldwide to this conference but we got the list of those they did invite so we invited everybody the world over and uh, when the time came they just didn't know what to do with all these people I think uh, yes I, think I remember that too I guess we answered all the questions, did we? Oh. Now, here's one. Uh, Jim? I, I have a, okay. I have a comment. I'm Laszlo Boren. I'm from Hungary, and I'm um, a fellow of the Cold War Research International Project to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, first, a comment, and then a question. A comment to Dr. Larson. Um, based on empirical evidence from American and Eastern European archives that were just opened, it is very difficult to empirically verify the thesis that the Cold War was an action-reaction process. Long before the Truman Doctrine, the Soviet Union has done much more to deprive Eastern Europe of its economic and political independence than Nazi Germany did until about 1939. <coughs> um, and the question to um, William Colby, um, do you, are you aware of any uh, specific attempts of covert action um, in the early 50s um, in Eastern Europe from the part of the CIA? Thank you very much. Well, in the early 50s, I think by the 50s we had stopped trying to drop people by parachute. I think we'd given them up by about then, uh, that it wasn't working. Uh, we still did have some connections with putative resistance groups or opposition groups in some of the countries. I can't name Hungary particularly, I just don't know. Uh, and of course we had the Radio Free Europe working very hard to bring free information into the country, so in a sense you could say yes. Uh, we also, I'm sure, were dealing with various exile organizations and receiving def uh, defectors and refugees from Hungary during that period. So uh, the answer is yes, we were doing some things, but they weren't, we certainly, I think we looked at the record of what Radio Free Europe had said in Hungary before the, the rebellion in 1956. And I think the German government was pretty well satisfied that we had not started the rebellion. We certainly hadn't stopped it either, but uh, on the other hand, that our reporting was factual reporting of what was happening rather than exhortations to go out and shoot some Russians, as I recall, the conclusion of the German government after looking at the records. Yes. <coughs> 
Mr. Colby, uh, I'm Wolfgang Krieger from Munich University. Uh, you referred to General Galen, and uh, we have heard very little in, in, in the course of this conference about uh, um, cooperation with friendly, other friendly uh, intelligence services, except for the, uh, the, the British uh, seeking uh, connection. Now, what was it in the, in the period that we're dealing with, the early 50s, what was it exactly that Galen uh, did for the benefit of the CIA? I mean, what did you actually uh, get out of this connection? I didn't deal with him myself, but, but I gather that the organization that he set up and then rebuilt, uh, when, when the Russians were overrunning Germany, uh, he had sequestered the files of his previous organization in the Wehrmacht, which covered uh, activities in Eastern Europe and on into the Soviet Union. He resurrected those files after the end of the war and peddled them to the Americans. Uh, and uh, we were attracted by the, the data that they had in them. And uh, we established a connection with his organization. It was always kind of a hands off, arm's length, I guess you'd call it, uh, our relationship. It wasn't a total embrace, but here was a man who knew quite a lot about that part of the world and had officers in his organization that had run. We consciously tried to stay away from uh, former Nazis and stick to the Wehrmacht people, but uh, I'm sure some former Nazis were involved too, I just don't know. But the main value was to have somebody who knew something about Eastern Europe and, uh, and on into Ukraine and, and Russia. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Jimmy Collins again. No. Zula, my, my affiliation is Zula Vineyards. And <clears throat> I'd like to add just a little bit to the Galen organization because in late 45 and through 47, I was in the intelligence division of U.S. Forces European Theater, and we operated the Galen group before we turned it over to the CIA. And it was a how shall I put it? It was a very extensive organization. However, they had a tendency to tell you what you wanted to hear. So you had to uh, be a little cautious with them. I might <coughs> also say that one of the things that, uh, one of the problems with intelligence right after the war vis-a-vis -vis the Russians was that many people in the military that I can speak for felt that we should not be spying on our friends and allies. And I was placed in charge of a small group, late 45, whose duties were to find out what the Russians were doing in Germany for our own military security. And this was a very closely held organization, and we were not we briefed the senior commander, but we did not indulge in any widespread briefing because there was a great deal of opposition to the, even the thought of spying on our friends. Yes, here. Uh, I'm Harry Ransom, Vanderbilt University. I would uh, categorize Dr. Larson's talk as revealing the tragedy of mutual misperception. My question is, will we ever know the degree of misperception on either side in, in order that we might understand the Cold War? Uh, Mr. Colby, Ms. Larson, do you think we will ever get at Soviet archives that will help us understand how much of a threat they were because much of what we did was a reaction to that. Well, there's one wonderful Russian document out recently, which is a briefing for Mr. Khrushchev about the Korean War. And it's absolutely enthralling. It says that Kim Il-sung made something like 25 or something 37. requests, 37 requests to start the war, and was turned down 36 times. Uh, he was also turned down by Mao. And the thing that changed Stalin's mind was an assessment that the Americans would not react. And he said, well, if the Americans won't react, go ahead. Now, of course, 
That coincides with Atchison's famous speech in which he left the Korean Peninsula out of our area of interest. So here was a, a very well-founded assessment which led to a war which didn't come out to be a correct assessment because Harry Truman wouldn't stand for it. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing. We had a similar one at the, at the uh, Castro conference a couple of years ago, yet last year, where the question of who had authority to use the, the nuclear warheads. And we had assumed that, that you had to get positive approval from Moscow. And that was true for the long-range ones. But it was not true for the tacticals because they were fearful that if the American troops landed in Cuba, that we would take out their relay ship in the middle of the Atlantic and you couldn't get word to use the tacticals. So the local commander was entitled to use the tacticals. When McNamara heard that, he physically blanched <laughs> because we were all set to go in. I mean, we had the Marines ready to go and the Air Force and all the rest. And if we had been met by a nuclear uh, attack, on our troops, we would have retaliated, and I'm not sure where that would have stopped. My name is Jim Hirschberg, and I'm the coordinator of the Cold War International History Project at the Woodrow Wilson Center. So anyone who's interested in new revelations and information from the Soviet and other archives from the former communist world is welcome to drop off a card or name and address, we've published three bulletins and about ten working papers with the Korean document and other documents and evidence um, on these questions, including, uh, by the way, just to correct that last comment, Gribkov has now acknowledged that on October 22nd, 1962, Khrushchev sent an order withdrawing pre-delegation for the tactical weapons, but Gribkov does say that that doesn't mean that in the event of an attack there was any physical barrier to actually using those weapons. Yeah. Our, my, our next working paper of the project is actually two papers based on the Soviet archives on the Soviet rejection of the Marshall Plan in 1947. And one interesting point that the evidence, which includes telegrams between Molotov and Stalin, shows is that at least initially Stalin did seriously consider participating in the Marshall Plan. It was not until uh, the eve of the Paris Conference that a definite decision not to participate was made. Which leads to my question to Mr. Colby. At what stage in those years did you believe that the Cold War had become irreversible? Was it a, an as operating assumption from the start that you were dealing with a divided world for the indefinite future? Or was there some event, the Marshall Plan, the division of Germany, the blockade, where you changed your assumptions about what the future looked like? I would put it at uh, the X article in 47, which said, you know, we're faced with this. There's George Kennan, I mean, not by name, but followed the long telegram, and I think that was about the government's conclusion at that point. That we're in for a long, tough confrontation. And we've got to manage it so we don't have it break out, but we can't lose it either. And, uh, you know, I, I'm in the article, uh, Kennan says that if we can contain the outward expan expansion, changes will occur. Well, it took 40 odd years for it to happen, but uh, nonetheless, at least it did. Dick Betts, Columbia University. A uh, question that's a bit open-ended, but with all the benefits of 2020 hindsight, uh, do either of the panelists, especially Mr. Colby, uh, think of things that this nascent intelligence organization uh, and capability could have done better in this period, either in terms of things we didn't do at all or did poorly or should not have done? <laughs> you get the hard ones to me. I'll take two, but you start. <clears throat> well, I think um, we could have made the Marshall Plan more attractive to the Soviets. Um, I mean, as I understand it, we deliberately imposed restrictions that would make it impossible for the Soviets to accept the aid. Uh, namely, um, <clears throat> that we would ha they would have to open up their economic records and that they would have to coordinate their plans with the rest of Western Europe, which meant that they would have to produce raw materials, you know, like an underdeveloped country. Um, I think since the Marshall Plan seemed to start off the chain reaction, if there could have been found some way in which to incorporate the Soviets into the Marshall Plan, that some of that reaction might have been averted, you know, at an early stage. 
Now, once you get to the formation of Germany, um, it's difficult for me to see how we could have um, done what we needed to do for German recovery without threatening the Soviets. I would say uh, the main thing we could have done a little earlier was to develop our technological intelligence capabilities because they really came as a result of our failure of our human and the inability to get agents back there and we finally sort of thrashed around to see how we would know what we needed to know about the Red Army and so forth and Dick Bissell and others in this agency came up with the U-2 and of course we went on to the satellite age and that has revolutionized intelligence totally revolutionized it. it's not human versus technical but it's the add-on that technical has given us is just astounding in terms of our knowledge now, if we had started that earlier, we might have had some benefits of greater knowledge earlier on, but, uh, but we did it out of frustration, not uh, out of brilliance. Norman Polmar, U.S. Naval Institute. Uh, a footnote to something that's been said about documentation and perceptions, and a comment as opposed to a question, if I may. We have to be very careful, I think, with some of the documentation, uh, as we have to with our own, we're getting from Russia now. I'm working on a Soviet Russian naval history program with the Russian Navy, and there are documents that they contend just no longer exist because as leadership changed, certain documents were trashed, and even in some cases, records of the documents having existed were trashed because the people were put in to get rid of the thoughts, the policies of their predecessors. Uh, uh, we found some examples already where a document has now exists canceling a document which was very important which is no record the previous document ever existed uh, in the log of documents in Russian naval headquarters or then Soviet naval headquarters uh, and it's just fascinating no one knows now because the people along since having been died normally naturally or for other reasons uh, as to what the purpose of the original program was. But just a document now canceling it, written in the 50s, but there's no way of knowing what the program was and what its intention, we know what it was, what its intention was in the 40s. So just the example of using or not using a certain weapon. Here again, we have to be careful that there are major gaps in their archives that I have a feeling we, may, we and they themselves may not even be aware of at this stage, going back to the 30s and 40s. I would just say that many of the new documents seem to confirm the interpretations that were already held. So. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Vladimir Poznikov, Institute, Institute of General History, Moscow. Well, uh, it will be rather a footnote to the uh, question before. Well, um, even if, say, naval, some naval records were destroyed, it doesn't mean that there are no traces whatsoever. Um, the mm, peculiar feature of Soviet archive system is that all the major documents or the copies of them, or special uh, memoranda on them, were sent to the party central committee. And you can always find a lot of documents there, not say in naval, naval or army or intelligence archive. It is my own experience. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kai Bird. I'm the author of a biography of John McCloy called The Chairman. I'm now working on a biography of the, and I'm now working on a biography of the Bundy brothers. Uh, in, in listening to the two of you, it seems to me you're uh, in listening to the two of you, it seems to me that uh, you're not speaking to each other or not sharing uh, assumptions about the Cold War. Uh, it seems we've heard two different histories of the Cold War. Um, but Mr. Colby, you've just mentioned Kennan's speech, and of course that, is, that was a very important turning point. But Kennan 
um, as you've pointed out, argued uh, and always has ever since that uh, he, that he never believed that that uh, the the two powers were going to come to a major to to, to an armed conflict. Uh, that the Soviets never intended to invade Western Europe. That it was always a political argument. Um, and Deborah's presentation seems to have the assumption that alternative policies, if the Marshall Plan had been more open-ended uh, uh, to invite the Soviets in, uh, that the Cold War could have ended earlier. Is this... Uh, it may have ended the same way, but uh, 20 years earlier would have saved us an awful lot in uh, money and in our economy and the, the fabric of our society. Uh, I, I asked the question, I guess, of both of you, but... I think that's true. I think at um, various points along in the Cold War, there were, there were critical turning points at which different policies might have led to an end of the acute phase of the conflict. By acute, I mean the ideological uh, zero-sum, um, all, all holds barred phase of the Cold War, which doesn't mean that we would be friends with the Soviet Union, but we wouldn't be in a struggle, life or death struggle. And I think one of them was the Marshall Plan, another was later after Stalin died, another maybe was 1957, um, right before we put nuclear weapons into, into Germany and so forth. I mean, there, there were various points along the way. And there's a psychological tendency to assume that what happened is inevitable. And, you know, they've done experiments with it. And um, until recently, when I would talk to my classes and, and tell them that it was possible that Germany might be reunified, they would laugh at me. Say, oh, no, Germany could never be reunified. <laughs> and I think, so I think um, we need to avoid this sort of psychological tendency to assume that everything turned out the way it had to during the Cold War. Well, I would say there are certainly occasions in which actions by our side stimulated a reaction on the other side. But I think the basic thought process all along on our side was defensive. Uh, there was very little offensive threat to the Soviet Union. Now, there were minor little things like Radio Liberty, but that's hardly a major threat. I mean, that's just the assertion of a right to put information out. Uh, whereas the rhetoric of the communist world uh, was very much one of world revolution and bringing out a change. And let's remember that we're just talking about Europe, but at the same time you had the Rangoon Conference in 1948, which said, let's go for broke in Southeast Asia. You had the in imminent turn takeover of China by a communist society. They broke finally, but it took 10 more years for them to break up. And there was a concern that this thing was a worldwide tide. Uh, and I think that in that sense, uh, that uh, the, the, that we, our actions were largely defensive uh, against that threat, against the danger of the further expansion. And that's why I say it started, uh, I think, in the perception of that by George Kennan. Thank you, Mr. Colby and Ms. Larson.
I'm, I'm wondering whether that gap between the two signs is agency SOP or their deep technological reasons or it's just an idiosyncrasy. Are there any other possible interpretations? No, no, all right. <laughs> well, uh, let me skip that and go to the introduction of our two speakers in the second panel this afternoon, which addresses the CIA and the Cold War in Asia. Uh, Nancy Tucker is an associate professor of history at Georgetown University, also teaching in the School of Foreign Service with specialization in American diplomatic history and American East Asian relations. She's the author of numerous books and publications, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States, 1945 to the present, which is to be published this year. Her PhD is from Columbia University. She was a resident fellow at the Charles Warren Center at Harvard in 1988-89, and serves on the board of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Harold P. Ford received his Ph.D. from the University of Chicago, was a postdoctoral scholar in Soviet and Chinese studies at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. He joined the Central Intelligence Agency in 1950, and during the Truman administration, served with the China branch. He served on the staff of the Board of National Estimates and later became vice chairman of the National Intelligence Council. Dr. Ford received the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal. A lecturer and author of a prize-winning book on national intelligence estimating, he has written two major works for the CIA history staff since he retired in 1986. I turn the floor over to Dr. Tucker and Dr. Ford. Uh, the comments that you couldn't hear before were we were speculating on why the signs of Tucker and Ford had to be moved apart on the uh, podium there, and we concluded that there was some discomfort by someone in the room at academics and practitioners associating too closely. <laughs> Uh, the moment uh, that I believe best symbolized the developments of the era that we're talking about in reference to the Cold War in Asia was, in fact, Dean Acheson's National Press Club speech that Mr. Colby just mentioned of January the 12th, 1950, in which Dean Acheson placed Taiwan and Hong Kong, uh, excuse me, Taiwan and Korea outside the U.S. defensive perimeter in Asia. Why was this such a significant address? Because in one stroke, it encapsulated the basic dynamics of the policies, pressures, and problems that characterized the Truman administration interaction with Asia between 1945 and 1953. Specifically, the speech demonstrated four critical realities. First, it made clear that the hearts and minds of policymakers in the Truman administration were with the last panel, deeply immersed in European affairs. Asia was decidedly less significant in their view, ranking at the bottom of most lists of priorities. Even after the war broke out in Korea, for instance, triggering a great escalation in the U.S. military budget and approval of National Security Council Document 68, much of the additional money appropriated went for the militarization of NATO and the United States rather than to fight in Korea. Of course, in so choosing, Truman and his associates were very much in the tradition of previous presidents and in tune with the American people, who also knew little about and were indifferent to Asia. This Atlanticism related intimately with another de decisive variable, the effort to take note of the limits of U.S. resources and the need to focus on defensible strong points of clear value to the United States. This was, of course, an absolute contrast to the posture of the 1947 Truman Doctrine, which had suggested U.S. involvement everywhere. 
Now the focus was rhetorically where it had always been realistically, on Europe, the Middle East, and occasionally Japan. Retrenchment also reflected the earlier decision by Truman to retreat from the anti-colonialism of his predecessor. Whereas the elimination of colonies and the fostering of democracy was desirable in Asia, Truman was loath to risk relations with US allies or dissipate resources in pursuing quixotic goals. Third, the willingness to place Taiwan and Hong Kong outside the US defensive perimeter suggests, I believe, that the Cold War had not yet arrived in Asia in full force. Atchison, in taking this position, was simply reiterating a perimeter strategy articulated the previous year by General Douglas MacArthur and reinforced by Joint Chiefs of Staff insistence that Taiwan was not important enough to warrant use of US troops to save it from Chinese Communist takeover, predicted by the CIA to be probable during the summer of 1950. The speech also reconfirmed the announcement by Harry Truman on January the 5th, 1950, that the United States was disengaging from the Chinese Civil War after years of funneling large amounts of aid to Chiang Kai-shek and trying through General Patrick Hurley and then the Marshall Mission to mediate a negotiated settlement, neither of which effort, of course, had worked. Although Soviet involvement on the island of Taiwan was considered an alarming prospect because of danger to sea lanes, this was still great power rivalry rather than ideological conflict, and not yet powerful enough to project the United States into a full-scale war with the communist Chinese. Covert activities, of course, were something else, and I'm hoping Hal Ford will tell us something about that. Similarly, there was a perception of Korea as expendable, seen as peripheral, with complicated and dubious politics. The United States had welcomed Soviet troop withdrawal late in 1948, and then pulled its own forces out with alacrity in June of 1949. Finally, point four about the Atchison speech, was the reception that the speech evoked in the United States. That clearly demonstrated the difficulties that Truman faced at home because of Republicans franti frantic to recapture the presidency after what would soon be 20 years of Democratic Party dominance. And of course, increasingly, the tensions bred by the aspirations of a particular senator named Joseph McCarthy. Atchison was first pilloried for having abandoned a loyal American ally on Taiwan, and later for having issued an invitation to the Soviets to invade Korea. There were calls for his resignation, and no one remembered that his remarks had been well within the parameters of policy concurred in by the military establishment. The outbreak of the war just five months later caught Americans by surprise, an intelligence failure, and a cause for much alarm lest it herald Soviet encroachment in Europe as well. The war did resolve uncertainty about the lengths that the United States would have to go to cope with the Soviet Union. It ended the reluctance to militarize NATO and the United States, and it eliminated indecision about commitments to Korea, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia. Earlier gestures had demonstrated the Truman administration's concern about potential Soviet expansion in Asia. Some historians have suggested that the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was informed in part by a desire to use atomic diplomacy to constrain Soviet aspirations in Europe and Asia. Later, the reversal of occupation policies in Japan with its abandonment of political purges 
unilateral termination of reparations payments, and preservation of the Zaibatsu industrial monopolies was designed to strengthen an economy whose continuing fragility risked domestic turmoil, regional instability, and vulnerability to communist contagion through infiltration or dependence on communist markets. So too, the secret provision of financial support to Paris, beginning in 1945 and becoming public in February of 1950, allowed France to free resources better to fight in Vietnam against a communist insurgency. This too indicated a willingness on the part of the Truman administration to try to stop the growth of Soviet power in Asia. With the Korean War, anti-communism for a time became all-encompassing. Prior to Korea, Atchison had successfully sidetracked those in the State Department, the military, and among the public who were the most belligerent. Ignoring men who wanted to place troops in Taiwan or stage a coup against Chiang Kai-shek in order to create a stronger, more responsive government on the island. In contrast, Acheson thought a lot about the likelihood that Mao Zedong might be another Tito. And he convinced the National Security Council and the President to approve an economic policy which allowed for limited trade with communist China, recognizing the benefits to Japan. But with the war, efforts to see communism as anything but monolithic ended. Aggression necessitated forceful response to make containment credible. It also gave Truman the opportunity to demonstrate to his critics that he was tough. The results of the attack can be seen in six immediate and longer term developments. First, Truman ordered the Seventh Fleet to patrol the Taiwan Straits so as to prevent the anticipated Chinese communist assault on the island. It also constrained Chiang Kai-shek, deterring his efforts to return to the mainland and at the same time drag the United States into a war with China. Although meant to be temporary, Truman found it subsequently impossible to extricate the United States from this commitment. And Dwight Eisenhower, of course, would eventually be forced to accept a mutual defense treaty with the nationalists as a result. Secondly, the administration provided technical advisors to the French in Indochina, supplementing earlier financial aid. And this, of course, was the entering wedge for full-scale U.S. commitment later. Thirdly, in the fall, the Japanese peace treaty was signed without either the Soviet Union or the Chinese Communists adhering, since they believed that the treaty represented a threat to strengthen Japan dangerously and also would ensure continued basing of U.S. forces in Japan. Fourth, the war led to the restructuring of the United Nations. Replacing an institution based on great power agreement with a new organization based on the Uniting for Peace resolution, which made it possible for the General Assembly vote to vote to bypass a Security Council unable to act should a Soviet veto be cast. The assumption, of course, was that since the United States controlled the General Assembly, if the United States wanted something to happen, it could always make that come to pass. Fifth, the North Korean attack led the Truman administration to the folly of trying to reunify Korea. Ignoring both the authoritarianism and ineffectiveness of the Ri regime and the warnings from Beijing that U.S. troops must not cross the 38th parallel and threaten China's borders, the result proved to be a wider conflict with American and Chinese boys killing each other on the peninsula. Still, of course, it was not as wide a war as some elements of the U.S. military and Chiang Kai-shek hoped it would become when they advocated blockading China, deploying nationalist Chinese troops on the Korean Peninsula, and aerial attacks, perhaps even nuclear ones, on Chinese supply lines and cities.
The world was spared such a conflict because all the belligerents and most of their supporters recognized the futility of massive engagement. On the other hand, the Korean conflict entrenched Sino-American antipathy for the following 20 years. The sixth is the only really positive result of the Korean War, and that was the fillip it gave to the Japanese economy. And for many Americans, Japan was really the only important actor in Asia anyway, because it had the potential of being the industrial engine for the region. The fact that war procurement invigorated Japan's faltering economy was perceived as critical. There were other developments in these years not influenced by the war in Korea that also demanded attention from Washington. First of all, there was the struggle for independence in the East Indies between 1945 and 1949, which eventuated in the end of Dutch colonial rule. In this prolonged conflict, the United States took a decisive part by threatening to suspend all economic aid to Holland if it did not grant independence. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, U.S. motives here were not primarily a respect for self-determination, but rather were influenced by the weight of domestic U.S. and international criticism of Dutch policy, which threatened to undermine support for European economic recovery programs. And the United States government was worried with continu about continuing instability caused by Dutch policies and the Dutch inability to end guerrilla warfare, potential of producing a communist government. Secondly, of course, in 1950, there was the Chinese communist uh, bringing of their form of liberation to Tibet. Concern about this development and American eagerness to destabilize Beijing would lead to significant and prolonged CIA involvement in resistance efforts. And thirdly, in Burma, remnants of nationalist Chinese armies, which fled the communist victory in 1949 and 1950, set up bases for continued civil war. During 1951, they staged two unsuccessful attacks on Yunnan province, but this did not, the lack of success, did not deter either the nationalists or the CIA. Operations would continue through the Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson administrations, sometimes with U.S. support, sometimes without, and sometimes with support so covert that it would continue even when much of the U.S. government believed that it had ended. The Truman administration then was confronted with a galaxy of problems in China, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, and Burma, to which it could bring to bear little prior knowledge or thought, about which it could muster only limited interest, and for which, as Hal Ford will doubtless make clear, covert solutions often looked more appealing than conventional policies. Let me end by returning to the beginning. Recent revelations from Soviet and Chinese communist archives ironically suggest that the Atchison speech, my symbol of the times, may have been as disastrous an error as contemporary critics insisted. This 1966 report that was just mentioned that had been prepared for the Soviet Foreign Ministry, uh, which was read and translated in 1993 by Catherine Weathersby, shows that the North Korean attack was not a Soviet effort to test American power or to tie Washington down in an Asian war or to s expand Soviet power and control. In fact, Kim Il-sung had to plead with Stalin for support. And Stalin's hesitancy was finally breached only because Stalin was convinced that the United States would not intervene. How was he convinced? The Atchison Press Club speech was not the only evidence, but it did weigh heavily. Similarly, Mao Zedong was preoccupied with preparing to attack Taiwan so as to bring the Chinese Civil War to a successful conclusion. He, too, believed Atchison. And 
he not only thought the United States would refuse to get involved in Korea, but more importantly, at least for him, he concluded that the United States would not interfere with the liberation of Taiwan, which he was in the process of planning. So in the end, McCarthy and those others who Atchison dismissed as Neanderthals may have had a point. His statements were probably ill-timed. In the larger sense, however, the critics were as destructive and perverse as Atchison asserted. By trying to ensure that judgments regarding Asia be made entirely on the basis of anti-communism, such people were wrong in their analysis of what was happening in China, irresponsible in overlooking the difference between ideological driven strategies and policy determined by great power rivalries, and foolish in making it possible for other governments to manipulate Washington by limiting the legitimate parameters for decision making. The arrival of the Cold War in Asia narrowed options and imagination, ensuring that hot war would continue in Korea and recur elsewhere, and as we know, that was Vietnam. For this, both the Truman administration and its opponents bear a significant degree of responsibility. be happy to see I brought this. Uh, as of 1950-51, I was the headquarters case officer in CIA responsible for backing up OPC's most ambitious China operations. My perception of those events this afternoon is a little blurry uh, because I forgot my glasses this morning. Uh, and I've been bailed out by academia, as often happens. Professor Cohen is nice enough to loan me his glasses. Therefore, if there's something I say with which you disagree, it's because I'm looking through Professor Cohen's eyes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, first, a couple of preliminary remarks. The nature of the Cold War in Asia, I feel, should be stressed as being quite different from that in Europe. Uh, yes, there was back and forth in Europe. There were misconceptions on both sides and so on. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm not convinced as an old fogey that the Cold War began in 1947. I recall that President Roosevelt, before his death, was concerned of Soviet misbehavior and backing off from, in many important ways from Yalta even before his death. Uh, also... I will go to my grave convinced that Stalin was more of a Stalinist than Harry Truman was. Um, okay. uh, but the key event that precipitated the Cold War, is, in my reading in Asia, was, of course, the North Korean invasion. Prior to that time, uh, CIA had been running some successful OSO or intelligence gathering operations, and I think I'm right that the only covert operations of any consequence prior to the invasion was sending uh, Colonel Lansdale and a small team to uh, the Philippines, where, as you know, CIA and uh, Colonel Ed Lansdale helped uh, Defense Secretary Ramon Magsaysay turn back the communist-led Huk Valahap or Huk uh, uh, rebellion. But uh, the events, the events, which sponsored large-scale U.S. covert operations, which is another uh, child, if you will, of, uh, of the North Korean invasion, was the North Korean invasion, and then five months later, the massive Chinese communist intervention. Usually when I'm on a podium, I'm talking about estimates. I'm not today, except to note that the U.S. intelligence community did not call the North Korean invasion invasion and five months later on 
on the question of where the Chinese communists likely to come in in a big way, I call your attention to the books that you have on page 351, an estimate from not just the CIA, but the then American intelligence community of 12 October 1950, which concluded there are no convincing indications of an actual Chinese communist intention to resort to full-scale intervention in Korea. Uh, not so good. I, one of the reasons for that was that the overweening influence upon estimates, as I understand it, was the, ma the man who knew the most about those questions at the time, and that was Douglas MacArthur. He and his headquarters consistently downplayed the likelihood of significant Chinese intervention. And thanks to the State Department's release of uh, earlier documents that's now in their published series, we learn that on the 24th of November 1950, Douglas MacArthur visited frontline troops, American troops in Korea, and assured them that the war would soon be over and, quote, you will be home for Christmas. Less than 24 hours later, the Chinese communist units that had lain doggo in North Korea struck the U.S. UN force in enormous force. Now the question was, how should the United States respond? MacArthur, a virtual law to himself and remarkably still a hero, recommended ultimately that the U.S. take extreme measures uh, against uh, China. In Washington, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, fearful of global war, urged more measured responses. And as we know, the latter arguments won out. The Truman administration proceeded to fight a limited war in Korea, and as part of that decision, directed CIA to take any and all measures it could to aid and abet the effort in Korea, especially measures that might impair communist China's ability to wage war there. Our covert operations uh, were of two kinds. One was in this sort of in the immediate war theater in, in and around uh, North Korea. And there, uh, CIA people uh, did a lot of uh, successful and good things in conjunction first with Navy, U.S. Navy people. They reconnoitered before the Incheon invasion, uh, that very successful invasion that MacArthur did pull off in September. Uh, CIA people uh, established escape and evasion teams. They ran uh, intelligence teams into North Korea and uh, China. They uh, were able to energize some 1,400 anti-communist Koreans in North Korea. And CIA, uh, having taken over China Air Transport, CAT, uh, performed uh, fine duties there because by the time of the armistice in mid-1953, uh, CAT had flown some 15,000 support missions to Korea and over flights of enemy territories. Or one such flight, as we know, ended in disaster in November 1952 when two American officers were downed in Manchuria and captured by the Chinese. Uh, the largest and most ambitious CIA efforts to assist the Korean War, however, were embodied in two simultaneous OPC China operations, or more uh, correctly, two and a half operations, as we'll see, which sought to support and run some tens of thousands of claimed anti-communist guerrillas in China, which, if armed and supported by the United States, could supposedly harass and damage PRC lines of communication, and hence uh, Beijing's ability to support its war effort in Korea. The first of these was, of these two OPC endeavors, operated with and through the nationalist Chinese government on Taiwan, despite the fact that official U.S. policy toward, it had, uh, toward the KMT had grown cool following the collapse of Chiang Kai-shek's regime on the mainland and $2.2 billion worth of U.S. assistance, which probably, I uh, interject, was another reason why it seemed that we were shifting uh, attention to Europe, because we had tried with what seemed to be our strongest ally out there, the, these great armies of uh, the GMO, and it had been proved a failure. But now, with U.S. U.N. forces in jeopardy in Korea, the Truman administration, acting through CIA, was receptive to Taipei's claim that it had, 
and this is the exact figure, 1,600,000 anti-communist guerrillas still answerable to it on the mainland. I saw that report and that map when it first hit headquarters, and it was a beautiful map with all kinds of indications of where the such-and-such country mother-loving anti-communist group was located and so on. A total of 1,600,000. Then, making use of close contacts and collaboration the U.S. Navy had had during World War II with Chinese nationalist intelligence. In early 1951, uh, CIA, I included, set up a business firm on Taiwan called Western Enterprises, which was a not very covert cover for supporting Taipei's claimed 1.6 million assets on the mainland. I must interject once again that some years later, a uh, academic friend of mine told me that he had gone to uh, Taipei and given a learned paper before a group of Chinese uh, nationalist historians on uh, the Ming Dynasty. His paper was on some aspect of the city of Beijing back in the 17th century. And in passing, he said that one of the problems that the central government faced there was that there was a group of bandits that operated near the western gate of Beijing. And he said their name in Mandarin is such and such. And he said the nearest English equivalent I can give to that in translation is Western Enterprises. <laughs> Whereupon his audience cracked up. Uh, but 1951's Western Enterprises grew to several hundred officers on Taiwan where they assisted the Chinese nationalists in guerrilla warfare training, logistic support, propaganda, small boat operations in the Taiwan Strait, and overflights of the mainland, which became deep overflights in 1952 when OPC and CAT picked up an unmarked B-17. Nonetheless, uh, the results of OPC uh, and the Chinese nationalists were so-so, and the coming of the armistice, uh, that operation was subsequently scratched. The second operation that OPC was running simultaneously uh, supported various so-called Chinese third force leaders, most of whom who had become refugees in Hong Kong following the fall of the mainland. They maintained that they were answerable to neither Beijing uh, nor Taipei and claimed that they still had tens of thousands of anti-communist guerrillas in South China responsive to their direction. These refugees were a mixed bag uh, of officers feuding among themselves. Some were former South uh, China warlords, some were so-so nationalist officers, and some were former outstanding nationalist officers, especially one General Tsai Wenzhi, TSAI, uh, who had earlier become crosswise with Chiang Kai-shek for having disobeyed the GMO's orders and stood and fought successfully on the mainland when he'd been ordered to, to retreat. You may have read General Tsai's obituary just two months ago in the, in the Post, which recounted how he had subsequently come to the United States and for many years had been to a consultant to the U.S. government on covert operations. That operation, the third force until 1953, uh, involved C, uh, OPC and CIA setting up a $25 million training base on the island of Saipan in the Marianas, and there trained third force Chinese in guerrilla warfare skills of various kinds. Uh, this operation, later operating out of Japan, subsequently infiltrated numerous paramilitary teams into China. But in the end, like Western Enterprise, this operation too uh, received or gained very little. The third OPC China operation, uh, which Professor Tucker has already told you about, I call it a half an operation, was uh, the support of a nationalist general, Li Mi, L-I-M-I, he and his small army had been pushed out of Yunnan into northern Burma. He claimed uh, in late 1950 that he still had 4,000 troops loyal to him there and many more still answerable to his direction in the mainland. OPC thereupon supported his effort to reinvade Yunnan and harass Chinese communist lines of communication. The operation proved a fiasco.
He invaded twice to a distance of 60 miles, was thereupon pushed out twice. And in the end, long diplomatic wrangling finally brought about the subsequent exfiltration of Li Mi and some of his people to Taiwan, though many others of his people remained in Burma and Upper Thailand, where they became farmers. <laughs> Poppy farmers. Uh. Now, 40 years later, what do we say about the varied success of these operations? The most successful clearly were those of CIA in the Philippines, where, with the help of a splendid leader, turned back the Huck Challenge and Mag Sai Sai Hai sub subsequently became president of the Philippines, probably in my, at least in my view, the best president the Philippines has had, but who tragically was killed in an airplane accident in 1957. CIA's operations in and around the, the war effort in North Korea were successful in many um, modest ways. The two big ambitious efforts, that is, Western Enterprises and Third Force, achieved only minor results de despite heroic efforts by CIA and the many Chinese who staked their lives on these operations. Most of the teams infiltrated into the PRC were never heard of again. At best, these operations can be judged to put some strain on Chinese Communist security forces and doubtless caused Beijing to divert some military units from commitments elsewhere. The Li Mi operation, a disaster from conception uh, to completion. Also, I'm in the dark about subsequent operations. Uh, I think these people operated on their own, uh, uh, mostly uh, making money. Uh, Forty years later, how should we assess, or what conclusions can we draw from these experiences? First, starting from a small operational base of officers and of experience, including my own, I was green and brand new. CIA did indeed make heroic efforts to assist the US-UN effort in Korea. S secondly, nonetheless, here as in other later CIA paramilitary operations, good intentions, enthusiasm, and frenetic effort were not enough. To be successful, such operations must have something very positive to work with on the ground. This did obtain in the Philippines, especially in the person and character of Ramon Mag Saisai. One reflection of the success which he and Colonel Lansdale achieved there is the fact that the latter subsequently became the model hero of a novel, The Ugly American. But later, in Vietnam, where no Mag Saisai exists and where the total picture was far more complex than it had been in the Philippines, Colonel Lansdale's efforts there brought little success, and this time became the model fool of quite another novel, The Quiet American. And as for Western Enterprise and Third Force, they doubtless had few significant assets to work with uh, on the mainland on, on which to base operations. Third, in 1950 to 53, many problems combined to thwart Western Enterprise and Third Force. Chief among these are the fact that first, the mainland assets which the respective Chinese leaders claimed nationalist and third force were grossly inflated from the start. And secondly, the overwhelming strength of communist China security forces almost certainly wrapped up such anti-regime guerrillas as existed. Thirdly, throughout its lifetime, the third force, moreover, uh, suffered from intense factionalism. The fourth conclusion, the efforts of the U.S. government to support and administer the ambitious Third Force and Western Enterprise operations were of necessity hurried, piecemeal, and somewhat ramshackle. Fifth, operations of their size, complexity, and priority rendered effective security almost impossible. Both the Western Enterprise and Third Force operations were almost certainly penetrated by the other, and each almost certainly penetrated as well by the Chinese communists. Six forces had been able to, to uh, harass Chinese communist forces in southernmost Yunnan. That would have had virtually no significant effect uh, on the ability of Beijing to conduct its war effort in far off Korea. Moreover, the Limi operation damaged U.S. relations with Burma and with the U.K. and helped beget a vexing drug problem in Upper Burma and Thailand that exists to this day.
somewhere, I've got notes down here, somewhere in CIA's files, I hope there is still on file a blistering critique of the Leamy operation written in 1951 by an OPC officer I am too modest to identify. <laughs> Seven, in Washington's early 1950s, uh, secrecy and frenetic deadlines led to a situation where OPC to some degree proceeded on its own, not being able to check carefully or fully, even with other offices of CIA, some of which I subsequently found out already had extensive files and so on on much of this material which OPC was, was doing from scratch. Eighth, and in Washington, all three OPC China operations, Western Enterprise, Third Force, and Leamy, suffered from super enthusiasm and super salesmanship of these operations to policymakers who were faced with a horrible situation in Korea and were eager that something, something had to be done to aid the war effort. And finally, and this is finally, in the case of all these three priority China operations, their operational assumptions were checked only hurriedly with senior U.S. intelligence and policy officials who were not themselves part of these efforts and who could have looked at the respective assumptions freer of operational enthusiasm and commitment. Hence, one of the most important lessons that these three China efforts could have bequeathed to future CIA paramilitary operations was the need from the outset to carefully check the assumptions of such proposed operations with outside senior review. Unfortunately, sometimes thereafter, this was not adequately done, and the most serious result a decade later was the Bay of Pigs. Thank you. Warren Cohen, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. A uh, question for Dr. Ford. Uh, with the benefit of my glasses, yes. do you think you could see your way clearly to tell us a little bit about the covert operations that began before the Korean War? For example, uh, what the CIA was doing to overthrow Jiang's regime in the spring of 1950. Overthrow who? to overthrow Chiang Kai-shek in the spring of 1950 and put in Sun Li Run. We have evidence of that both from Dean Rusk's personal testimony and in the files of the uh, embassy, and also the involvement of CIA with uh, Muslim forces in the far west of China at that time. Thank you. I can speak with some knowledge a little of the latter. Uh, yes, long before the outbreak of the where there was, quote, involvement, simply intelligence involvement. There were some, some anti-communist Muslim leaders, especially a general, a couple of General Ma's, Horse Ma, in the Northwest. Uh, they were used for, for intelligence operations. There were contact back and forth. It never went very far. Uh, and was in, involvement, yes, in intelligence gathering, period, about the plot to overthrow I draw a complete and utter blank. Uh, it may have, it simply has never crossed my radar screen. And if, if something that kind ever did exist, it changed quickly because from then on, CIA and, and Chiang Kai-shek were buddy-buddy till the end of time almost, with the nationalists often feeling that CIA was the real American government and not the State Department. Uh, but I, I really can't comment because I have no knowledge whatsoever. I'm Sue Rochewald from the American University. My question to uh, per Dr. Tucker is, um, if we say that the subtext of today is um, what really happened and what can we learn from it, how much are you using oral histories as primary sources in your research? I have, tried, I have tried generally to um, interview uh, and use oral history wherever they existed and wherever people were accessible, but I have also tried not to rely on those, but rather to use those as supplements to documents. And that's not always possible. For instance, the research I've done in the People's Republic of China has been almost exclusively interviewing. 
Uh, fortunately, in the last couple of years, some young Chinese scholars have begun to get into documents and have begun to release those. And I've been relieved for the most part to see that they substantiate some of the things that I've learned from the the participants. Um, I do think there's an enormous importance to oral history and that interviewing is clearly critical. Uh, the trouble is, of course, that people's memories are selective and one obviously can't rely on those unless you can corroborate them in some way. Uh, Paul Kreisberg, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Nancy Tucker, when she was making her presentation, made a reference to another CIA operation in Tibet, uh, which you didn't touch on at all, Hal. And of course, CIA's involvement and in support of Kambas and other Tibetans, which began in the early 50s, continued really on through the end of the 1960s uh, uh, at, at the very least. Uh, I wonder if you'd say a little bit about what we were trying to do, what our objectives were in, in dealing with the Tibetans? Uh, there's someone present in this room who perhaps more than anyone else uh, could theoretically comment on that in great detail. I cannot because it, it was not in my particular uh, ballywick. And even as a historian, uh, it's taken me into other things. My impression is that although there was contact from the early, that the significant operations did not uh, begin until after the, admin, the uh, Truman administration. I will stand corrected if I'm wrong. But, uh... Hi, Bill Leary, University of Georgia. And to respond perhaps to Professor Cohen, uh, there was, I think, more in the fall of 1949 than simply intelligence gathering in northwestern and southwestern China. Uh, an intelligence officer was sent out there in the fall of 1949 with wider authority, or at least he used wider authority, and there was the shipment of arms and ammunition both to the Muslims of the northwest and also to the dissident groups in the southwest. So the origins of the third force really date to the fall of 49. Uh, also, the decision to purchase a civil air transport as the agency proprietary was done before the Korean War in yes. April of 1950. So there was a major asset in place. Now, I think you're quite right that this all expands after the Korean War, but there was uh, some interesting activity uh, prior to the Korean War. Yes. Uh CIT, CIT uh, as a follow-over from, from Chenaldon, had was busy during those years, and CIA, nascent CIA was interested in uh, closer relations, and finally they did, as I understand, gain control of CIT prior to the, and I didn't mean to imply that it came after the invasion. Uh, yes, I think there were some small shipments to folks in the, in the Northwest, but this was really small potatoes uh, and was in, uh, I think, probably in, in lieu of, of money, gold bars or drugs. Uh. John Prados, I'm an author. Uh, I think that something more needs to be said about that notorious uh, intelligence appreciation of October 12, 1950, the one about, about the, the one about whether the Chinese would intervene, the two sided, that's on October the 12th, 1950. As I understand the story of that particular estimate, it was right before Harry Truman was leaving for Wake Island to uh, talk to MacArthur, and he asked for a set of seven different reports to be delivered to him at his airplane before he left. And it was a request that came into the agency late in the afternoon after most people had gone home. There was nobody there. The IAC members were called back into an emergency session to coordinate this. The estimates themselves were actually done at the Pentagon by military intelligence representatives. And as I understand it, the only CIA representative who participated in the estimate was Ludwell Montague. Um, so I think that 
little footnote should be added because of the sensitivity of the October 12th prediction and then the almost immediate actual Chinese attack in Korea. Okay. Uh, I have a question apart from that and that is um, I'd like to get a reading on your feeling of whether the kind of enthusiasm and intense passion that existed for um, combating communism at this time led to some of these kinds of decisions to support very questionable uh, uh, local force uh, political movements that we thought might go out and combat the communists. Okay. Uh, kind of a twofold on men, John. Uh, the first one about the 12th, yes, that there are the circumstances. There were other estimates made before and after the 12th which have not been released, but the answer was similar in all of them. They did not take a serious view of that. I was not in that office at the time, but I've had close colleagues who were, who told me that essentially it was a matter that pretty much the working class, or the working class, whoops, working level, uh, sorry about that. Uh, animation in the hall. <laughs> working level uh, were, were quite concerned and had it pretty right, but a lot of the seniors that, well, son, if you knew what I knew, and General MacArthur just told me, or General what's-his-name, who was his J J2, just told me, uh, we, we shouldn't underestimate uh, MacArthur's influence on intelligence judgments, nor underestimate his responsibility or his role for the U.S. having crossed the 50th, which was a stupid thing to do and to go north. Uh, as far as enthusiasm and was there a passion for fighting communism, <clears throat> there might have been in some office down the hall, but there certainly were none in the offices with which I ever had. It was a matter of national interest, and we'd been attacked, and UN forces were supporting us in Korea. It was fighting a war, and it was simply that. Uh, in fact, later I can remember arguing with some folks who won from elsewhere who wanted to talk about, well, this is an ideological thing. I think it was seen by most of the people making judgments uh, and operations that these were questions of national interest. And when the interests of the United States were threatened uh, or when we were attacked, we'd respond, period. Communism, whatever be damned. Yeah, let, let me just, on a footnote on that, though, one of the things I think that's interesting, a very interesting source of material on a lot of these things comes out of British archives. Uh, and the British were often um, commented on American activities with a great deal of humor and uh, often quite acerbically. And I think that's particularly true in reference to the Burma operation <clears throat> that we were talking about earlier. Um, that some, most of the information I think that, that's been particularly useful on the continuation of those operations on through Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, really to the eve uh, almost of normalization, uh, came out of British records where they couldn't believe that the Americans kept putting uh, resources into what was clearly a losing Neither operation. Can I. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that we'll have to conclude. I'd like to have a round of applause for both panels this afternoon. What I'd like to ask you to do is to leave your belongings here, that includes briefcases, cameras, any kind of recording devices, and we're going to take a fairly quick tour of the agency and then wind up with some light refreshments, and we need to be back here at 620. There will be security guards, so your materials are quite safe here, okay? <laughs> now, we are... <laughs> We are going to go outside the front entrance and then re-enter in the main lobby. So if you want to put your coat on, you may. It's about, I'd say, 100 yards at the most. Thank you.
Yesterday, CIA Director James Woolsey announced his resignation, effective by the end of January. The Senate Intelligence Committee will hold confirmation hearings for a successor to be nominated by President Clinton.